Hello and welcome to another In the Armchair uh, teaching series. Uh, I've entitled this teaching today, uh, Moving On With God. Now, in order to move on with God, we need to begin by checking that our kingdom worldview is actually the biblical one. Otherwise, it will stunt our growth as Christians and we will miss out on so much blessing. Uh, here's an example of what I mean. Many of us think and speak of our church building as God's house. I'm going to God's house on Sunday and welcome to God's house, sir. And of course, in a very real sense it is. It's a building set apart and dedicated to God's plans and purposes and it should be treated with due reverence. It is a property used for teaching, uh, preaching and prayer, worship and fellowship. It's a place we trust will be powerfully used by God. However, Although it is thus rightly spoken of as God's house, God does not live there. And a wrong understanding of this much used phrase can subconsciously lead to a divided life. Uh, we know God is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere inhabiting even the highest heaven. Yet in the Old Testament, God chose to tabernacle, to live in the very midst of his people by dwelling first in a movable tent, and then in an immovable stone temple. And so this can cause people to still think of God today as living in a building. Now, his earthly dwelling place was, of course, a sacred place, a very sacred place. In fact, the most sacred place on earth, a place that was so sacred that only one man, the high priest bearing the blood of an innocent animal, was allowed to enter the very inner sanctum, the most holy place, once a year. Now, it's not in the Bible, but it's understood that a rope was tied around his ankles in case he was struck dead as he entered through the heavy curtain where the Ark of the Covenant resided into the very presence of the living God. Uh, if the bells around the hem of his garment fell silent and there was no response from him, the watchers would know both he and the sacrificial blood he had presented on their behalf had been rejected. They would then be able to pull him out of the most holy place by the rope. However... When the people saw that their high priest, who was representing them, had been accepted, they knew that they too were accepted, as equally accepted as the high priest inside. Now that's a powerful image to attach to God's dwelling place. But all this was the type for the future New Testament spiritual. Solomon's temple, for instance, the outside wall was stone taken from the dust of the earth, representing our body. Then the stonework was completely covered in, in the inside with beautiful Lebanese cedar wood, which has a very pleasant scent and is very resistant to rot, representing our souls. And finally, the cedar wood was covered on the inside with pure gold, representing our spirit. Now, when that man-made building that trinity was dedicated to God, his presence was pleased to come and dwell within it. And so that place was God's visible temple on earth. And what a precious place for him to dwell in. However, Calvary changed everything. When Jesus died on the cross, on the, cross the heavy temple curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place was dramatically torn from top to bottom from heaven to earth, powerfully signifying that God's vital presence was no longer to be viewed as confined there. A huge New Testament truth to be proclaimed is that God does not live in temples made with hands. Acts 17, 24 says, The God who made the world and everything in it, Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by human hands. Now, the Old Testament's tent, temple and rituals were the promise of the real that was to come. The real in every sense was Jesus. When he, the Lamb of God, entered God's presence on high as our great high priest offering his own blood, he was fully accepted, which means that we whom he represents are accepted also as equally accepted as our great high priest. What a powerful truth. Amazing grace. Jesus spoke of his body as this temple in whom the Apostle Paul wrote dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We meet God in and through Jesus Christ, who is seated at the Father's right hand. A little wonder the term in Christ is used so often throughout the New Testament. But here's the point of this teaching. Uh, when we were born again, alive and abiding in Christ, God's Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, came to abide in us, making us his visible temple here on earth. John 20, 22, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth to proclaim this great truth. 2 Corinthians 6 to 16, You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. 
Now pause and consider the unimaginable value he puts in us in whom his spirit dwells. You and I individually and corporately are now his visible temple here on earth. And here's the lesson. That temple is sacred, very sacred. The most sacred place on earth. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17, Paul writes, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroyed, destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. No wonder the Apostle John could proclaim in 1 John 4, 4, The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You see, when we think of the word church, we've become accustomed to think of a, a building made with hands, used for religious services. Indeed, Webster's Dictionary has this as the primary meaning of the word church. In the New Testament, however, the word used for church is ecclesia, which could be more accurately um, uh, translated as assembly or congregation. So, anywhere that we sincerely gather together in Jesus' name is where God in Christ is pleased to manifest himself. In Matthew 18, 20, Jesus said, For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. That meeting place could be a church building, a house, a jail, a beach, a rooftop, a cathedral, a gospel hall, a mud hut, a tent, a rented hotel room, or a mountainside. Uh, you get the point, I'm sure. But is it an important point? Well, I believe it is, because many of us live our lives as if they were divided into the sacred and the non-sacred. I think it's predominantly a Western mindset. For instance, a man might speak graciously to his wife in a certain way because on Sunday they are on God's house. In the moment he exits the door, he might feel free to talk to her in a less honouring way because they are now outside God's house. Likewise, a woman might not indulge in gossip while in church because she's in God's house. Yet on returning to life outside, she, she might give free rein to this behaviour because she believes she's no longer in God's immediate presence. He lives in church, in a building. Uh, unbelievers, uh, of course, see the hypocrisy in behaving righteously in church on Sunday and living another way the rest of the week, and they are influenced away from Jesus. Mahatma Gandhi was turned away from Christianity and remained Hindu. He said, I don't reject your Christ, I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ. He also claimed that if Christians would really live according to the teachings of Christ as found in the Bible, all of India would be Christian today. A uh, French philosopher and writer Voltaire said, If Christians want us to believe in a Redeemer, let them act redeemed. The Jewish people have always understood that every part of their existence is sacred. Uh, they even have a prayer for going to the toilet. Anyway, in the Old Testament, priests were people especially set apart by God to minister to him and to the people. Their positions were indeed sacred. However, even under the New Covenant, we still tend to view the pastor or minister who holds kingdom office as sacred and we the laity as not. Uh, too often the perception is that we don't have to live our lives under God as holy as they do, but we do. We're all called to be priests unto God, all part of God's sacred spiritual house. As the Apostle Peter emphasised in 1 Peter 2.5, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Uh, four verses later, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Now, rightly we would be horrified if we went to church on Sunday and there was a, a great big um, TV set up and certain unsavory programs or movies were being played because we define rightly the church building as being sacred. Yet wrongly, in our homes, we happily cross these boundaries because we don't classify our homes as sacred. Uh, missionaries are rightly regarded as sacred and are prayed for at the front of the church. Yet, wrongly, the men and women who go into the mission field of secular work daily, praying that they might be a light in darkness, would never expect the same sort of prayer because we classify missionaries as sacred and ourselves as not. Uh, leaders deserve honour, of course, even double honour, as the Bible says. But they're not in the sacred camp while we are standing outside looking in. Our tithe is rightly regarded as sacred, but wrongly, the rest is usually not regarded as such. Our ministry, our church work is rightly regarded as sacred, but wrongly, our, our business, our, our marriage, uh, and especially the marriage bed, are 
usually not thought of as sacred. Uh, quiet times at home are rightly regarded as sacred, but wrongly, as soon as we move into the day, we revert back to au naturel, because the rest of the day is usually not regarded as sacred. Can you see that if we develop a faulty kingdom mindset, we greatly hinder our development as Christians? See, once we can find God's interaction with our lives into the sacred and the non-sacred, then starting with our church building, we fall into the trap of dual thinking and dual behaviour. That phrase, the Sunday saint and the Monday sinner. Consequently, a portion of our lives and behaviour is set apart for God and the rest is set aside for ourselves. Uh, what does an undivided life look like? Well, 25 years ago, I wrote this short plea um, from the depth of my heart. I still remember the evening, evening that I, I wrote it. I'd just come back from a training run on a, on a cold, wet winter evening. I went upstairs to the bedroom, closed the door, wrote it out and put it into this Good News Bible that my mother and father gave Linda and I when they heard that we had become Christians. So this is it. Um, the opening line is on the outside cover, Dear Jesus, I Want. And then the main content is on the inside uh, to give more of me to you, uh, to trust you more than me, uh, to praise you with actions, to see you and every person that's fortunate than me, to think first what you would say before I speak, to think first what you would do before I do, to fully understand your will for me, to love more, to encourage more, to heal more, to confess you more, to be more humble, to be more joyful, to be more peaceful, to live in you, to die in you, to meet you. With a concluding sentence on the back, which says, Dear Jesus, please give me what I want. Am I there yet? Oh, if only. But the desire for Jesus to be glorified in every part of my life, every moment of every day, still burns within me. Every morning in life, before I have my shower and refresh my body, I kneel down and refresh my commitment to God. I say, Heavenly Father, this day I bow the knee to you and to you alone. You see, if you're content to drift through your Christian life, you will probably do just that. I would counsel you to decide how serious you are in your intent to follow Jesus and after prayerful consideration, write it down and keep it and keep refreshing that commitment because we default to what about me so easily. Here's the big idea. In God's eyes, every part of your life and my life is sacred, all day, every day. How beautiful, how precious. You see, when we understand that and agree with that and live like that, things change. First Peter 1.15, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Now may we be true ambassadors for Christ, always, everywhere. Our heart is home. Now can I leave you just with two questions to ponder. What have you subconsciously classified as sacred and non-sacred in your life? And how has this affected your thinking and your behaviour? Now, uh, this teaching has been taken from chapter 8 of my book, The Great Adventure, The Challenge of Really Following Jesus. It was published in 2014, and I pray that it challenges you as much as it still challenges me to this very day. Anyway, amen, and God bless.